this video I'm going to show you how I built this awesome combination wood burning pizza oven and slow smoke cooker. Whether you got a hankering So uh, <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit about what got me started on this project. Uh, it's not like I'm a huge pizza freak or anything. Uh, I am in the construction business, so about 2008 I got kind of an itch to, to do something something big around the house. So I had been watching this program called Jamie Oliver's uh, at Jamie Oliver at Home. He's a British, British chef, Jamie Oliver is. And if you haven't seen that show, it's pretty good. And uh, the guy was, the guy's got an incredible pizza oven in his backyard and, and just rocks that thing with all kinds of stuff, not just pizza. He cooks all kinds of stuff in it. So that's kind of where I got the original idea. And, um, you know, at the same time, I also like barbecue and, and wanted to have a slow pit, uh, slow smoker, uh, offset smoker, pit smoker, and really didn't have the the uh, energy to do both and didn't have the space in my yard to do both. So I decided to see if there was a way I could combine both of them. So here's how I kind of put it all together. One place I found on the web that was a great resource for all things wood oven related was fornobravo.com. These guys sell everything from prefabricated ovens. They've got specialty materials and tools for building and operating your oven and they even sell ingredients for uh, good pizza. So the area of the Forno Bravo website that I found the most valuable though was the forum section. In the forums, you're going to find a bunch of people, including me, who are sharing uh, wood oven information. Uh, they've got in their entire projects from start to finish. Um, here you're going to find a lot of wood oven stuff, uh, more than you can handle. They've got design ideas, pictures, they've got construction techniques, they've got what worked for them, what uh, didn't work for them, their horror stories, and, and uh, they even got uh, recipes on the forum, so it's a great uh, resource. Let me talk a little about a few concepts about wood-fired cooking. Everyone's familiar with grilling, which is uh, basically just direct cooking over an open heat source. And a wood oven is different in that it transfers the bulk of the heat from the flame into the walls and the roof and the floor of the oven. Here's how it comes together. First, you have a structural concrete base or hearth. As you can see, there's a depression under the oven uh, for the insulation where I used a perlite uh, cement insulation, which I'll discuss in detail later. Then there's the floor where I use fire brick. Then here's the inner dome, which is also fire brick. The flue is located at the mouth of the oven. If you think this is a little counterintuitive, I agree. But if you think about it, in terms of trying to retain heat, you don't want all the heat going straight up the center of the dome and out the chimney. The oven will draw fresh air in through the mouth of the oven, radiate the fire's heat throughout the whole oven, exhaust out the flue in the front of the oven. The inner dome is then insulated. Then you can build the outer dome. You can build that out of brick or, you know, really pretty much anything you want at this point. When you cook in it, the fire is started in the middle of the chamber and the oven is brought up to temperature. As you can see from this graphic, what I was talking about earlier with the fire efficiently spreading its heat all through the oven with the front mounted flue location. When it gets hot enough, around 900 degrees, you push the fire back towards the rear of the oven sweep the ash back towards the fire and the pizza cooks directly on the brick oven floor. Now as you can see from my finished oven and from Jamie Oliver's oven, it appears to have a center mount chimney and flue. This is only aesthetic. Both ovens exhaust to the bottom of the flue at the front of the oven and the flue is routed to a center stack chimney. Most ovens don't make this transition and the chimney goes straight up from the mouth of the oven I just didn't like the look of that, but if you don't mind it, running the chimney straight up is certainly easier and more efficient. Now a slow smoke barbecue pit cooks in a completely different manner. Low heat and smoke are essential to good barbecue. This is normally achieved with an offset firebox. The fire is built to the side and the smoke from the fire enters the cooking chamber, goes across the food and out the flue. These pits really don't require any insulation because the cooking temperature is much lower, you know, around 225 to 275 degrees, but the pit does become kind of a heat sink that stabilizes the heat during cooking. So my solution was to add an offset firebox that would exhaust through the oven and out the oven flue. The oven space acts as the cooking chamber, 
but my only challenge was to get the smoke from the firebox into the oven. So let me show you my design and ultimate solution. Um, I used a program called SketchUp, which is free to download. It was owned by Google. It's owned by another company now, but uh, it's a very easy to learn 3D drawing software. Here's a fly around video I did using SketchUp. I decided to go with an igloo design for my oven. Here's a section shot of how I got the smoke from the firebox into the oven. The oven is supported structurally with an 8 inch reinforced concrete masonry units. Each 16 uh, inch long block has two voids or cells. The wall is reinforced by filling every other cell with reinforcing steel and concrete. This leaves a void running the full height of the wall that can carry smoke into the oven. I made this brick inside the oven removable so whenever I wanted to smoke something I'd just slide it out and then whenever I wanted to use the upper oven I'd just slip it back in place. So here's how it all went down. I selected a spot in the corner of our brick patio. The patio uh, we have is used Chicago brick, so I used that same brick for the outside of the oven. I ended up using about two cubes of brick for the entire oven. I cleared the sod from the area where the base is going to be, and I formed and reinforced a monolithic slab and foundation. When I say monolithic, I mean the slab is thickened and reinforced under the area of the slab that's going to be carrying the structural load of the oven, which is where the reinforced concrete block walls uh, will go. I want to stop for a minute and tell you that this project is located in Central Florida. We're uh, fortunate down here to have sandy soils and we don't have any freezing weather down here. If you're going to build somewhere where you got a lot of cold weather, uh, you'll need to get your foundation down below the frost line. If you don't do this, the freeze-thaw cycle will uh, make the soil expand and contract and is going to cause the foundation to heave and it's ultimately going to fail. And likewise, if you're in an area that has expansive soils like silt or clay, I'm talking about areas like Houston and North Carolina, you're going to need to put several inches of um, probably like six inches of well-drained gravel or sand below your foundation because rainwater will cause the same kind of heaving below the foundation and, and it will cause it to to crack up and, and fail. You definitely don't want to go through all this work, and it is a lot of work, and have a disaster like that happen, so do your homework on the foundation. The space you see between where the block walls are going is going to be an open area below the oven where I'm going to store wood. So I formed and poured a sloping section of the in the center of the slab there so that any water that got up into that space would drain out towards the front and out of the wood storage area. Next thing I did was dry stack CMU blocks and I filled the cells that had rebar in them with concrete so it was basically every other cell. I went ahead and put some brick ties in the joints of some of the cells that were getting filled. Next I started uh, forming the concrete structural hearth. As you can see in these pictures I went ahead and laid what brick I could uh, there in the wood storage area because once the hearth is poured over the top it was going to be real hard to lay that brick so I laid what I could beforehand. To form the arch, I just made a cardboard template to the radius that I wanted, uh, pulled the radius with a, a length of string and pencil. I went ahead and cut uh, out some three-quarter plywood supports to that radius, and then I ran one by two battens every six inches perpendicular to the plywood arch. Then I covered that with two layers of ha uh, quarter-inch masonite. I used the masonite because it would give me a nice finish on the bottom. And I used two layers of quarter inch because a quarter inch would flex easily over the curve and two layers would probably be enough strength to hold the concrete without deforming. One thing you need to keep in mind is that uh, the wet concrete is going to be heavy as hell. So don't underestimate the strength of your formwork. When in doubt, always make those forms stronger. I'm telling you, a form failure during a concrete pour is a big disaster and a mess, so you don't want that to happen. On the front of the hearth, I did some decorative formwork uh, to give the concrete some character. Uh, I didn't get a real good picture of it before the pour, but here's what it, the uh, form looked like after I stripped it. Basically, it was some three-quarter inch plywood, and I wrapped the edges with three-quarter inch, uh, or actually quarter round uh, wood, and the centerpiece was just an oval-shaped decorative wood trim piece that I bought at a millwork at the millwork department at Lowe's. The idea I had for that uh, middle piece was maybe to put some kind of uh, brass or ornamental metal there at the face of the oven on the, in that recess, but I haven't done anything with that yet. Before you pour, you want to make sure you put a lot of oil on the forms. Um, 
This can be really just about any kind of oil, like mineral oil. This is going to help the uh, forms uh, separate from the concrete when you're stripping them. And one last thing that I wanted to point out is that I have uh, put, I went ahead and put small metal pans over the block cells that's going to remain hollow. That's going to keep the concrete from filling those during the pour. And as far as reinforcing, you probably want to run number five bars at least on 18 inches on center, you know, depending on the thickness of the base and the length the concrete's going to span. You also want to have uh, probably six inches at your, as your minimum thickness of your concrete. Next, it was time to pour. Um, I think it took about 25 bags of concrete mix. I went ahead and rented a mixer uh, and I went ahead and solicited some help, uh, some muscle to help me out with this uh, part of the project. If you don't have a concrete vibrator to get the air pockets out, you're going to need to uh, tap the forms with a hammer. It, it basically, everywhere the concrete will be exposed, you want to get rid of any air pockets that are in there because uh, that's going to cause some honeycombing once you strip the forms. You can see where I blocked out for the smoker flue with some 2x4s over there off to one side. And once the concrete had partially set up, but not completely, I went ahead and slipped that blocking out. If you wait till the concrete's fully set up, it's going to be a nightmare to get those, it was going to be a nightmare to get those blocks out. So in this picture, you can see how I did the block out for the perlite insulation that I'm going to put at the bottom of the oven. Basically, I just put four inches of styrofoam, which is, has to be held down because it's going to want to float in that wet concrete. The next day, I stripped the forms and here's the result. I didn't strip the bottom forms out yet though. The concrete doesn't really reach its full strength for 28 days, so you want to keep the bottom supported as long as you can. And at a minimum, you want to support it for seven days. Here's an abbreviated video I did making the perlite concrete for the bottom of the oven. You can see the full video on my YouTube channel if you want to watch that. So. Okay, I've basically taken uh, two and a half buckets, five gallon buckets of the perlite mix and put it in the wheelbarrow. Uh, last time I put in uh, it was like a slurry mix of the uh, cement so this time I'm gonna put in try to put the half a bucket of cement in so that'll give me a five to one mixture and then it's add water and try to mix it. I think it might work a little easier so let me try I'm gonna try that. All right out. now I'll just put the half a bucket of Portland cement in. That's my last of it. Hopefully that'll finish me up up here but uh, I'm not sure so now let's uh, fill this bucket up with some water and slowly add water and see if uh, how it mixes up. A little bit more in there. So I've probably used up about two thirds of the bucket and you can see the consistency that it looks like right now. It's, it's uh, still got some white flecks in there. So I'm gonna make sure everything's coated. Make sure there's no big lumps. Make sure you dig all the way to the bottom to get all the perlite or vermiculite up and mixed in so there's not any batches the pockets down there. Uh, I've been mixing probably about three or four minutes total. You know, about halfway through, I added some more water. Ended up using about, like I said, two thirds, three quarters of a bucket, something like that. You know, so it was two and a half buck buckets of the perlite, half a bucket of Portland cement, and about two thirds of a bucket of water. And uh, this is the consistency it looks like when I get done. There's still a few. Uh, you know, globs of, of Portland cement that I'm going to try to break up, but I think this thing is about ready to shovel yeah, in. A little bit in. I think I might end up being a little short. Uh, hard to do the camera work and work at the same time, so I'm going to end up doing is level this out, see how much I'm short. I'm, Unfortunately, I don't have any more Portland cement here, but I do have some masonry cement. I might mix up a little bit more to uh, get it finished up, and then. Uh, but I'll let you see what it looks like when I level it out and kind of work with it. Well, I got like a screed here that I'm going to use to kind of make sure everything's oops, on the same level. Just kind of left over two by four. Definitely not going to have enough. I'm definitely going to need some more, but I'm going to level this out as best I can. But this is kind of some weird stuff. So I'm going to have to mix up a little bit more though, I think. Right, I'm just kind of trying to roughly level it here with a mason's trowel. I'm going to probably be half inch or so shy. And I've heard people say 
I'm going to probably leave it a little shy to try to use some fire clay to, to uh, level it. But I think I'm still going to be too shy for that. So I might mix up some with some uh, masonry cement. And that will probably work okay, I'm thinking. So I hate to leave it like this and not get done with it once I get everything, all my tools out and everything. So I'll give that a try. But anyway, this is what it, this is what it uh, looks like when you work with it. Off a few times back and forth just kind of gets the high spots knocked down and you can take any kind of leftover and fill in any low spots but I'm trying to just keep it down a little bit lower than the than the structural part of the hearth so I can uh, have a little adjustment room for my bricks to all sit level but uh, ended up going pretty nice kind of Still kind of bizarre stuff, like everybody says, but uh, not too hard to work with. Easier than I thought. Bye. Once I had the insulation installed at the bottom of the oven and it had, it had set up, uh, the next thing I wanted to do was do a mock-up of the dome and the oven opening and shape those with some brick on some masonite. I went ahead and scribed the outlines of those onto some wood and cut the wood into that shape to use for templates and jigs for the opening and the dome. Now it was uh, time to get started on the inner dome. I uh, went ahead and started uh, with a base of fire brick for the floor of the oven, which I laid on the perlite insulation. You know, I put down a little uh, layer, a thin layer of fire clay and sand to try to keep the brick level. Now I use fire brick on the inner dome. You wanna use fire brick here because it's uh, really made to stand the, the uh, heat of the oven, which is gonna get pretty hot. You wanna do the floor in a herringbone pattern because you don't wanna have any joints that are going to catch a pizza peel as you slide it in or out so herringbone pattern puts those joints on an angle and makes that less likely to happen so after I got my oven floor done I went ahead and laid up my first course of fire brick which was a soldier course and that went around the uh, floor of the oven one thing to keep in mind the mortar mix you want to use on the inside of the oven is needs to be heat resistant so basically what you're going to have to do is mix fire clay into the masonry cement and sand that's one part clay for the fire clay, two parts masonry cement, and six parts sand is the mix you want to use. If you use just regular mortar here, you're going to run the risk of the, the mortar failing and spalling due to the high heat, so you want to mix some fire clay into that. Before I started on the dome itself, I wanted to get the mouth of the oven built. So I started that by laying the brick up on the two sides of the mouth of the oven. Then I made a temporary wooden support for the brick over the arch of the oven mouth with the uh, template that I made earlier. I made this front temporary support a little short in height, and then I took some shims, uh, brought it precisely up to the position I wanted, laid my brick. Once the brick had set up, I went ahead and pulled the shims out, which made the, the uh, support a lot easier to remove. It's, if you make it real tight, it's gonna be tough to remove, so uh, make it a little short and put some shims underneath it. Here's a good picture of the opening for the smoker box. And in this picture, you can see the jig that I made for the um, oven dome. Using that jig as a template, I started laying up the brick on the inside of the oven dome itself. You want to taper this brick towards the inside of the oven. The reason you do this is the gravity is going to want to pull that brick towards the inside of the oven. And the taper will give it a mechanical lock so that that can't happen. The next few pictures I'm showing here is the intersection of the inner dome to the mouth of the oven, which was pretty tricky to do. So this will really test your brick cutting skills. And here's a good picture of the opening into the oven from the offset firebox. I kept on going with the uh, inner dome of the oven, and as the dome started sloping up, I started using small wooden supports uh, out of some wood shims to temporarily support the brick until the mortar set up. You'll get to a point though, unless you're a really good mason, where, where it, as you get real close to the top where even this doesn't really work, so I had to find another solution. What I ended up doing, what a lot of people do when they get into this position, is they go ahead and build what they call a sand dome. So what I did is I cut out a piece of plywood in a circle once you've got this plywood in position, you take sand and you shape the sand into the final shape of your inner dome. 
and basically just lay the final bricks on top of that. Then once that brick is set up, you can just drop the plywood and then you sweep all the sand out. So it worked real well, except for you can see in the picture, some of the mortar didn't come out too even. I tried to get in the oven with a masonry piping bag, but didn't have much luck. I was worried that uh, I was gonna have some spalling from the heat, but over the four or five years I've been using it, none of that's happened yet. So, you know, I wouldn't feel too worried about it. Since I knew I was gonna route the uh, chimney over to the center of the oven, I wanted to kind of reinforce the center the center part of the dome and basically what I did was put a, a thick bed of mortar and reinforce that with some wire over the over the very top of the inner dome where the chimney was going to be located. I didn't want the fire brick to fully support the full load of the uh, the chimney flue once I put it up there. I figured this would give me a little additional strength and spread out the load over a broader area of the uh, inner dome. I want to point out a detail here at the oven opening you, may, opening you may have missed. It is a about a three quarter inch lip all the way around the oven, the mouth of the oven right here on the back side of the flue opening. And the purpose of this lip is to be able to seal the oven off the day after you cook it, or actually after the fire wanes. And basically what you have is a big insulated heat sink here and if you put an insulated door here, you can come in and the next day and roast a chicken or bake some bread. A lot of people do that. I haven't built an insulated door for it, but uh, I plan on doing that at some point someday. But you want to go ahead and put that lip on there as you build your oven because it's an easy detail to do and, and gives you that option later on. Once the inner dome and the throat of the oven were complete and the dome had cured for about a week, I started the process of test fires. This is a series of ever increasing fires. I'd say at least five of them, which I did as I started work on the chimney and the outside of the oven. You want to do this slowly get, to get the inner dome up to its working temperature and get everything settled in place and ensure you don't have any masonry failures. This also lets you know if your oven's drafting the way you want it to before you cover everything up. So here are some pictures of how I did the offset chimney. Uh, the first thing I did was lay down a bed of perlite concrete over the front of the oven dome and then I also put on a fairly thick bed of it over the top center where the chimney was going to be located. I smoothed out the top of the perlite with some fire mortar to make a smooth surface where the smoke would be traveling. Then I cut a large piece of clay flue pipe in half, I think it was around 13 inches by 13 inches and I mortared that above the layer of perlite and transitioned that into the vertical chimney flue. There was a lot of cutting and fitting to do to get it to transition correctly, but as I was doing all this, I was continuing the test fires, and they were getting pretty big by now, and I wanted to make sure my flue and chimney routing would draw well, and fortunately it did beautifully. As I started building the brick outer dome, I thought it might be a good idea to go ahead and mock up a temporary offset firebox to see how well this uh, oven would work as a smoker. I built a temporary door for the mouth of the oven and threw together a few leftover pieces of brick and flue material to make the firebox. And then uh, smoked some ribs in it and it worked pretty well so I continued on down the line of making this into a combo oven smoker. So I kept coming up with the brick on the outer dome similar to the inner dome and I went ahead and purchased some high temperature bat insulation from Forno Bravo to insulate the outer dome and it's a really good and efficient piece of insulation and will stand up to the heat which regular bat insulation won't. But it's fairly expensive and it will not support any weight at all. Bat insulation loses a lot of its R value if you compress it. So the bat insulation is a great solution if you're tight on space because inch per inch uh, on thickness, this is a lot more efficient than perlite. But I didn't have much of a space constraint, so I wrapped the inner dome with bats and filled the rest of the space up with loose perlite. Towards the top of the oven, I went back to the perlite concrete to give me a little strength and cohesiveness to the insulation at the top of the dome. And then I precast a concrete plate that would help support the outer brick of the chimney. I put that in place, ran the brick up, and I precast a couple of other pieces to finish out the top and to protect the chimney from rain. That last top piece was a nightmare getting on top of the chimney. 
here I am topping it out. At this point I had a fully functional oven and in the construction business we have a tradition when a building is topped out that we have a topping out party. So I made my first pizza and it wasn't too bad for the first one. If you notice in the pictures of the outside of the oven, I've got a band of brick here near the base of the oven. I left this brick recessed because I intend to put some tile here. I'm thinking like a blue or maybe a multicolored band of Mexican type tile would look great here, but I haven't been able to find anything that I thought would really fit the bill with regards to the size and thickness and color. Here's a, a picture of what I was thinking. And I haven't really put 100% effort into this, into finding the right tile, but I've looked pretty hard. I know somebody with a ceramic kiln, and I thought thought I might end up uh, making the just making the tiles myself, because I only need like 28 of them. If I uh, do that, I'll go ahead and post a video of that process, because I'm sure that'll be interesting. So by this time, I'm totally sick of laying brick, but I still have a lot of brick to lay around the base of the oven. I first finished up the brick around the sides in, of the uh, wood storage area, then I brought up the rest of the brick uh, on the outside up to the level of the structural hearth. Now that I had the sides of the oven pretty much done, I turned my attention to the box for the smoker. I poured a small concrete pad and built an inner box out of fire brick and topped it off with the other half of the clay chimney flue pipe that I laid on a slope. And uh, then I built the uh, outer walls and the roof with uh, old Chicago brick. I filled the void between them with perlite and sand, just trying to keep the outside of the box from getting too hot. This uh, box may look pretty small, but it doesn't have to be real big. You don't need a huge hot fire here, just a small smoldering one to cook uh, the food and smoke the food slow and low. And I went ahead and put a cast iron door here. Uh, this one's made by company called Vogel Zhang. I think you, I found it on the internet and uh, this will let me control the temperature of the fire a little bit so and it's worked pretty well. So the next thing I had to get done was the top and the front landing of the oven. I decided I wanted a bluish gray color concrete and did some test mixes. Uh, bought some black uh, dye from my local Lowe's store. Uh, the blue dye was a little harder to find so I ended up using actually some latex paint blue paint and uh, color came out pretty good. I decided I wanted to precast the pieces. So I broke the top up into five sections and precast the first piece and it turned out to be a lot harder to do that than I thought because of the fitment around the oven. So I ended up casting three of the remaining pieces in place and then precasting the last piece which was the front landing of the oven which was the most prominent piece, precasting that to get a really slick finish on the uh, top. As you can see from these pictures, none of it turned out really great. I even tried polishing it with uh, polishers and dense fire. Still didn't come out as slick as I want. Uh, maybe one day I'll um, wreck those tops out and put granite in if I get rich someday. We'll see. The last thing I did was build a little prep table next to the oven. We have an architectural salvage yard that's pretty close to me that had these really thick pieces of granite which they salvaged off the old Orlando City Hall building that was imploded back in the early 90s. Um, you can watch this implosion if you rent the movie Lethal Weapon 3 because they used it in the opening scene. Anyway, I got it for about 75 bucks and it's pretty thick, uh, like three inches thick home plate shape, perfect for uh, laying your dough out and getting your pizza ready. So the first thing I did was poured a really good sized foundation, at least, you want to go at least two foot by two foot, and put a couple of rebar dowels in it. Then I dry stacked eight by 16 inch CMU block, and I dropped rebar in those and filled it with concrete. I wanted the uh, granite to be solidly mounted into the base, so I ended up drilling holes into the bottom of that that would line up to the block cells, drilling holes in the bottom of the granite. I took some epoxy and epoxied some all thread <clears throat> into the bottom of the granite. After the epoxy setup, I screwed toggle anchors to the all thread that would end up around eight inches deep inside the filled concrete cell. I filled the concrete blocks with concrete and put a pretty good amount of epoxy on the surface of the block that the granite would be setting on and wet stuck that top with the all thread toggle anchors into the block, into the concrete in the block. 
it's about as solid as you can get. The uh, granite is really slick and I use it to roll out my dough directly on it when I make pizza. Uh, when you get done, you can just hit it with a hose to clean it off and makes it pretty easy. So as you can see from some of the pictures, I was experimenting with putting some lime plaster on the base to finish it, but uh, didn't like it. So I ended up getting some copper sheets and wrapping that directly on the base using uh, clamps and liquid nails. The idea here is that it will uh, eventually patina to a really nice green. I also planted some clean vines at the base, but as you can see from those pictures, the vines do not like the copper at all and just won't cling to it. I need to dig those out someday and do something different. And it's been about five years since I did the copper and it still hasn't gotten that patina yet. And I think it's because the top protects it from the weather, but it'll eventually get there and it's going to look pretty good. So. So here's the last thing I did to the oven. I wanted to show you, which is essential. And uh, stay tuned to my channel if if you want to see some recipes and me cook some stuff in here. Uh, you can subscribe. If you've got any questions? Uh, hopefully, I can help you out if you're actually going to build one of these. And thanks for watching.